I'll share some things as a student, because I've been one, and as an instructor, because I've been one in the army as well, and as a parent, because I am a parent as well. And I think from these three perspectives, I just want to share some of the elements that have guided me through my life. So my first advice to all the children sitting here, all the students, and of course, most of you are achievers, and that's why you have reached this place, but uh, I'm sure uh, many, some of you might also be like me, the tail enders of the class. <clears throat> my first advice to you is you don't worry. Don't worry so much. Because even the topper of the class is worried. <laughs> Where will I get admission? Will I get it in this college, that college, or whatever? You are more worried, will I pass the next exam? So your worry is much more short-lived. The one who is stopping the class is much more worried about, you know, much longer-term issues and all of that. And honestly speaking, I don't think you need to be worried. In my belief, in my experience, you don't choose professions. Many times, professions choose you. And whichever profession chooses you, you will do well in that and you will be happy and you learn this a little late in life. I'm sharing this with you and I'm sure a lot of people sitting in the front who are older and who have experienced life will tell you this, that happiness and material wealth or material possessions, they have no connection whatsoever. They have absolutely no connection. And many times the things that we seek to achieve, whether it's to achieve uh, admission in a prestigious college or to get into something which is very difficult to get into, Usually, they are external scorecards which have been made by somebody else. They are not your scorecards. They are not what you want to do. So my first advice to you is you don't have to worry. Things will be fine. The second thing I want to share with you, and especially children uh, who are going to go into a world now, because the world of today is actually very, very tough. Uh, it's unlike uh, what most of the parents think, that the children have it easy. I think the children have it much more difficult today. One advice I'll give you is whenever you're choosing a role model, <coughs> choose your image of the role model, not the human being who is the role model. Let me give that to you with an example and then you'll understand why I'm saying this. Who is supposed to be the greatest teacher of them all according to the Indian mythology? Anybody? Dronacharya. Dronacharya is supposed to be the greatest teacher. Matter of fact, there is an award called the Dronacharya Award, which is given in sports to the greatest coach, to the teacher. Who was his greatest student? Ekalavya. Not Arjun. Arjun was not his greatest student. The greatest student was Ekalavya. And how did Ekalavya learn from Dronacharya? He created a role model made of clay. And he watched Dronacharya and he believed that the Dronacharya that he watched had the character of the clay model that he had built. And of course, he practiced a lot. If Arjun fired 100 arrows, he would fire 200. If Arjun practiced for 10 hours, he would practice for 20 hours. But the real Dronacharya turned out to be a capitation fee teacher, right? For his own student, to make sure that his own student got ahead, he actually killed the sport. So many times, when you choose your role models, your human role models will let you down. And therefore, it is much better to create your own image of the role model and not be disillusioned whenever the real role model lets you down. My last advice to you as students is this, that you must know that all teachers who ever become teachers, they joined that profession because somewhere they were idealists. Sometimes that uh, idealism gets covered with the daily routine of just trying to stay alive and stay survive and just do that eight hour shift day after day after day. And sometimes it's the job of students to keep reminding the teachers that it is truly an ideal, in, it's, it's an idealistic profession because the, a teacher, I mean, we just had a young lad explain how even by touching 10 lives you actually touched 1500 lives. You can imagine what teachers do throughout their career. They actually make a lot of people achieve their potential which otherwise they wouldn't have. And I can give you some examples of this which I hopefully will be able to tell you one of two stories which will tell you that. For teachers, I have a couple of uh, things that I wanted to share. I myself was an instructor in the army. I, my job was uh, to train young officers who would then lead their own troops into battle. And uh, it was a tough job. 
because uh, unlike the private sector or the corporates or any other profession, <coughs> we don't have the luxury in our game that if we make a mistake this quarter, we'll make up in the next quarter. It doesn't work like that. If we lose market share, we don't have the ability to make it in the next quarter. If we make a widow this quarter, she'll remain a widow for the rest of her life. If we make an orphan this quarter, that kid will remain an orphan for the rest of their life. So as an instructor, I had to be a little harsh because we had to train our young officers to hold the lives of more than 100 souls in their hand. And I want to go back to my own days as a, a student in the academy. So when I passed out of the Indian Military Academy, I was 413th, uh, sorry, 313th in merit out of a course of 400. So that takes a lot of hard work huh, to come 313. We are the ones who made the remaining 75% possible. <laughs> so after my joining the unit, in the army we are sent for courses and our first foundation course is called the young officers course that's the first foundation course where you know your career is kind of decided after that how you perform in that course kind of determines uh, which which path your career will take now for an officer who has been 313th in merit even the commanding officer even my boss didn't have that much of expectation and in the army we have a uh, grading system which is Alpha, Bravo and Charlie. Any army brats here will be able to tell you that. Alpha is 75% and above, Bravo is about 60% and above, anyone, anyone who is below 60% is considered to be Charlie. So in a course you will normally have about, in a course of 100 you will have maybe about 4 or 5 Alphas, you will have about 20, 30 Bravos and maybe about 40 to 50 Charlies. That's the way the course is sort of pans out. So when I was going for the course also my CEO told me, try to get a bravo, come say come bravo lelena, don't come in buddy Charlie. That was the expectation that he had. And I had also decided that in life, okay, I'll try to be a bravo so that I'm in the middle. If you're in the front, you have to do a lot of hard work. If you're in the back, you will get kicked a lot. So, you know, somewhere in the beach, mein, ko ro, ke mein. so you'll be fine. That was my sort of understanding. And so I'd set up my routine. I used to study for the first lecture in the class one or two topics and be the first one to answer a question so that the you know instructor has registered me ah okay this chap has answered and then go off to sleep throughout the class in the evening do the bare minimum effort required to get to the next day and that was my life during that course and then i had an instructor called sandeep bajaj he is a very senior officer now but that time he was just a lieutenant one day he just walked into my room and he saw that i was getting ready to do my favorite in evening pastime which was going to the bar so uh, he asked me, where are you going? So I said, sir, I'm going to the library, you know, to study and all. <laughs> so he said, you're going to the bar, aren't you? I said, well, sir. So he said, why don't you do one thing? My sense is you are heading for an alpha. You have the potential to get an alpha. Why don't you just give it a shot tonight? Because tomorrow is a midterm exam. Just work on it tonight. And if it doesn't work out, you can always go back and make up, you know, day after tomorrow for all your quota, you can make it up. I don't know whether he was telling me the truth or not. I, I still don't know till date. But that night, that one person telling me, you know, I said, what the heck, let me just try to do it. And I put in maybe two, three hours of effort in that night. And the next day I performed well. I went on to become not only an alpha in that course, but I got an instructor grading in that course. And from that day, my life changed completely. Because within two or three courses, I had started topping the courses and by the fifth or the sixth course, if my name would be there on the list, people would now argue who will get the second prize because the first one is gone. Now this didn't happen magically overnight because I was quite happy to be a mediocre student. I was quite happy to get a bravo and come back. That was my aspirational level. And if I had got a bravo and come back, I would have thought I'm okay, I'm do I've done well. But for this one person who came and found that spark, and I think that's what great teachers are supposed to do. Great teachers are supposed to treat every child in the class as if it is their own child. If it is your own child, you're not going to give up, even if the child is a bravo, you're not going to give up if the child is a Charlie. And I think the true hallmark of an instructor, which by the way in the armed forces is not given to anyone and everyone, you have to earn that badge that you wear on your shoulder. And truly great instructors seek the weak students because it is only then that their capability comes out. If you take a 95 percentile child and make him 98, your value add is 3 percent. 
But if you take someone on whom the entire society has given up and said he is a Charlie or she is a Charlie and make that person come into an alpha, then you have earned this badge of an instructor. Then you can truly say that I am an Acharya. Otherwise, to my mind, this value add of 2 to 3 percent on somebody who is already performing very well does not qualify a person to call themselves a true teacher. These days, there is so much of uncertainty, there are so many choices, there is so much of pressure that actually children have a fairly, fairly tough time. So this belief that a lot of parents had that we had a tough time and they've got it easy just because there's some tools and technologies and phones and iPad doesn't make life easy. It actually makes it far more difficult. I'll tell you this story uh, of, of, a, of a friend of mine uh, who's, uh, both of them are exceedingly well, uh, they're doing very well and their son was about 15 years old. And one day I'd gone to the house for dinner and I casually asked their son that, you know, what's the mobile phone you have? I just wanted to check what, what instrument he had and he said, I don't have a mobile phone. I said, you don't have a mobile phone at the age of 15? And both the parents immediately jumped in and they said that we have decided that we are not going to give him any distractions so that he can focus on his board exams. And after he does well in his board exams is when he'll get his first phone. I think we are doing great disservice to our children if we are going to create artificial conditions in which they succeed because these artificial conditions won't exist in the real world. This boy will be competing with people who have been trained how to write an essay while they are listening to music, chatting with their friends, maybe even watching TV uh, uh, you know, with, his, uh, you know, with his other eye. And in that environment, he is training how to produce an essay. Now this child who has been told no noise, no disturbance, nothing and all of that is going to sit in a cubicle where there will be workers around him and he will not be able to produce anything unless he is given that sanitized environment. So many times when I see parents trying to protect their children by giving them artificial conditions that they can create inside their own homes but which cannot be replicated outside in the real world, my sense is we are not strengthening our children, we are actually handicapping them. So it's very important that we actually start exposing our children to failures, to making mistakes, to most children who do exceedingly well in school find it very, very tough to encounter failure because that is their first failure that they'll encounter and because they have not been trained how to encounter failure, the crash will be very hard. And in some cases, we are aware, in some very, very sad cases, not being able to meet a certain expectation has resulted in the child actually thinking life is not worth living. The second thing I want to actually share is I think the young generation of uh, leaders. You're all leaders sitting in the back. You don't have to become an elected leader to become a leader. You're all leaders. Their learning will come from various different sources. They won't come necessarily from the hierarchy that came from in our time. In our time, you could say that people with white hair or people with no hair, they have more experience than people with black hair because the world was very structured. Uh, a 10 years experience manager was better than a 5 years experience manager. A 20 years experience person was supposed to be better because he has seen, uh, he or she has seen a lot of uh, uh, life and, and experiences of what can go wrong during those 20 years and therefore their experience counts. But in a volatile world of today and tomorrow, uh, experience could actually be a, a, a disadvantage. Lack of experience, uh, a fresh pair of looking at eyes, a different way of doing stuff is probably the answer here. So many times we as parents need to know that a lot of our learning of our children will come from their peers and, and their friends and their associates. And there I urge the parents to start a different kind of an education for them. And that education is more in terms of their lateral and vertical diversity. Let me explain what I mean by that. So many times I tell uh, uh, my friends and their children that, you know, if you have to work in the world of tomorrow, you will have to collaborate. And that collaboration is, by the way, extremely tough uh, mechanism or a very tough skill to learn, and especially for our generation. And I'll tell you why. Because for 15 years or 18 years of schooling, we were taught to write our answer like this. Remember? Those in the front row will remember this. First you hide your creation, and then you create. And 20 days later, two years later, you're told, now you collaborate. So how will you collaborate? Because you have been trained to first deny information. Somebody just said data is power, information is power, so I must hide it.
from the others. And suddenly, 20 years later, they're expected to collaborate. It's not going to happen. Let's not do the same disservice to our children. And we must train them to work with other people from other cultures, other parts. And typically, when I say this, and I tell parents that we must teach our children other languages, languages other than their, their own. And most of the parents will immediately go, yeah, I must teach them French and German and Spanish. I would urge you, you should teach them Malayalam, Tamil, Marathi, Gujarati, you know, because that is where 90% of your child's future will be. What I mean by vertical diversity, it's an interesting story I want to tell you. This is about, uh, <clears throat> this is a true story, by the way, about the American school uh, in 2005. You remember there was this flood in Bombay. You remember that? Because of the heavy rains, there was this flood. And this flood actually happened in Mithi River. The Mithi River uh, f flew over, and some of you who visit Bombay will know that it's on the bank of this river that you have uh, the American school on one side, and then you have the slums on the other side. So what had happened was immediately after the floods, <coughs> the, the American school obviously has mostly expat students, and the Indian students who are there, studying there, are obviously children who come from extremely wealth wealthy families, very well-to-do, and they are of a different... Uh, financial uh, strata. One of the teachers in the school, after this event got over, after this uh, uh, catastrophe hit Bombay, was trying to collect clothes and books for the children who were in the slums on the other side. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, when she was talking about we need to donate clothes and books and give them material, one of the students said, one of the students remarked, uh, that uh, the government is also helping them. It's not just that the government is not helping them, the government is also helping them. So the teacher pointed out, yes, that could be true, but what has happened is because of the flood, many of the children have even lost their Russian cards, their identity cards, the families have no way of proving that we are staying in that slum. And immediately another Indian girl remarked, very innocently, she remarked, that, oh, you mean they lost their passports and their travel document and all of that? Now, it wouldn't be a laughing matter if it wasn't so serious because the leaders who are going to govern the country tomorrow are on this side of the bank and their knowledge about whom they are going to govern is so flawed, it is so wrong that unless we as parents start increasing the vertical diversity, and what I mean by vertical diversity is that unless your children know the children of your maidservants, the children of your drivers, the children of a completely different economic strata, they will be handicapped as leaders when they'll grow up. They will grow up in a la-la land. They will grow up in a la-la land where they will believe that Peter Drucker or Michael Potter can solve problems. That, can't, that doesn't happen in real life. In real life, as I mentioned, leadership is a contact sport. You need to be able to look into the eyes of the people whom you are following and tell them, follow me. And they'll only follow you if they believe that you know who they are. So I think one of the greatest service that parents can do for their children is to give them lateral and vertical diversity. And I think we must also do it for one simple reason, that every person sitting in this room, no matter how blessed they think they are or how cursed they think they are, each person sitting inside this hall has won the lottery of life. Each one of us belongs to that point zero 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 one percent of Indian humanity who have had it all. We were born in the right family, we got the right breaks, we got the right bets taken on us, we got the right education, we got the right people giving us the right guidance and we had so many planets that had to fall in line. If anybody sitting in this room is kidding himself or herself that it was my hard work which got me here, the rickshaw puller who pulls a rickshaw for 16 hours a day does hard work. Hard work didn't get you here. Hard work was one of the criteria which was universal, it was the lowest common denominator. We are indeed extremely fortunate. And remember this thing, that these kids, you see on the streets out there who have to beg a certain amount of money every day. If they don't bring back that money, they get beaten. But for the grace of God, they could have been your kids. But for the grace of God, it could be you. But for the grace of God, it can still be your kids. There is no guarantee. Life doesn't come with a guarantee.
that's a guarantee that they will do well in life. You want a guarantee, you buy a toaster. Life doesn't come with guarantees. So in many ways, I think we owe it also to our good privilege to go beyond the cosmetic things that we do to you know, sort of make it appear as if we are doing some good stuff, but actually get down to the grassroots, actually ask whether our children have got friends who come from a totally different social, financial, economic strata, have they got friends who come from a totally different culture, totally different religion. If we don't do that, then as parents, I think we are failing in imparting one of the most essential elements of education, which is how do you work with people who are different from you, not how do you keep on creating cliques of people who look exactly like you. That is completely wrong education. My second last point would be that I come from a background of the armed forces, and I proudly believe that whatever I have attained in life, all the education I needed, I got in the army. So whether it was communication, whether it was strategy, whether it was the ability to lead people, whether it was technology, most of you don't, most of us maybe don't even realize this, that the armed forces is the mother load of everything that eventually 10, 20 years later comes into the corporate world. So whether it is technologies like radar, sonar, internet that we use on a daily basis, commercial aircraft, they all originated from war. Span of control. The span of control of a section is 10, of a platoon is 40, of a company is 180, which is exactly the span of control of a Facebook group. Everything that we have seen in life, even the, the terms and the words that we use in our daily life, they come from the army. When 10 people were brought and one person was made in charge of them, usko das logon ka hawala diya jata tha, that's where the word havaldar comes from. When in good old days, kings used to have a small standing army and whenever they were in war, they used to call people from various subas and risalas and the person would bring them. That's where the name Subedar comes from. So in many ways, our lives are intricately linked to the army. I would encourage a lot of parents to think and consider sending their children into the armed forces. I know a lot of them believe that it is a dangerous place. <laughs> But honestly, I have to tell you, seeing the rest of India nowadays, something, sometimes I think the army is a safe place. You know? <laughs> so, please think about that uh, seriously. Even if your children join for just about 10 years, my sense is they will not only join a family, but they will be trained for life. They put life pushes them on the chest with a finger from a 20-floor building. They will spin and they'll land on their feet. Because that's what the forces will train them for. My last... Uh, it's not, it's a personal story I want to share with you because uh, sometimes in this world of cynicism and targets and achievements, we uh, forget that uh, we should sometimes dream and sometimes believe. This is a true story, by the way. My uh, daughter, when she was born, my mother and my, my mother's death and my daughter's birth had a one month difference. So my mother never saw my daughter. She could not see her because she was extremely ill and though the, the, her birth and her death overlapped by one month. Uh, uh, my mother could not see her granddaughter. <clears throat> and uh, I remember I was staying in Bombay when my daughter was about two years old and my son was maybe about five or six. I used to travel a lot to Delhi and I used to stay in a place called Kandivli, some of you might know it, in a, in a high-rise building which had an open balcony. Uh, I mean, you could open the uh, window and there was a balcony, which most Bombayites would know is a very rare thing in Bombay, huh? balcony. So, <laughs> this is one of those houses. And I used to travel to Delhi very often. And I traveled to Delhi on some, you know, work. And in the night, I, like every night, I used to call the kids and speak to them. And this night, when I called back, they were very excited. They were super excited. I said, what happened? What happened? So, apparently, what happened was that when they came back home in the evening, and they were sitting in that hall, suddenly a parrot flew and came in into the room. And then the parrot was not at all behaving like a wild bird. It walked around the house and it must have been somebody's pet parrot who got lost or whatever. But the kids were super excited by it and this parrot has come and of course, you know, we had a policy that not inside a cage and all, we'll never keep birds in a cage and all. But this bird was like roaming around the house and also they were very excited. But they decided that we we're going to leave the windows open so that if the parrot wants to fly out in the night, the parrot can fly out. But next day in the morning, guess what? The parrot is still there. And they are again very excited and they said, today we'll buy a cage and we'll buy a big cage and we'll leave the door open if they want to come. There are all this planning is happening. And they went to school 
And when they came back from school, the parrot was still there, though the windows were open, and they were super excited. And I was coming the third day. I was returning on the third day. Again, I spoke to them in the morning, and they were very, very excited. And I took off from uh, Delhi to come to Bombay, and when I landed, I picked up the phone and I spoke to them saying I've landed, and they were completely dejected and completely depressed, because apparently what happened is this parrot, which came in into the house, would sit in the balcony, fly out, come back again, it last took one flight and didn't come back. And they kept waiting and waiting and waiting, but the parrot never came back. So when I came home, both the kids were very sad. They were very unhappy and they were very sad. And I don't know what came into my head. And I, 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 don't, I have not planned it or anything. I just said, you know what? I think this is your dadi who had come to see you. Because she had not met you. And she wanted to see you. So she came in the form of a parrot to see you. And she knew that if I come and see her, I'll recognize her. And that is why she flew away before I came. <clears throat> now the funny thing is, as my children grew, and as the children sitting behind have grown, and as our children have grown, you know the phase at which they stop believing in the tooth fairy. You know the phase when they stop believing in Santa Claus. But strangely, both these kids are 17 and 14, they still believe that maybe that parrot story is true, and I believe that too. And I think the last thing we need to do as parents, teachers, and children is also to keep the child in us alive. Because as children, we were actually quite happy with nothing. We were quite okay. We never had these you know, criteria that unless you have a bigger car, you can't be a friend of mine. Matter of fact, you remember this in school and college. In your group of four or five friends, the one who was the most influential, who would decide when you would bunk class, when you would go to see a movie, was neither the richest person nor the person with the most resources. And yet that person was the one around whom you hinged your entire day. So with that, I thank you very much once again for this wonderful opportunity to come and speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sita. Thank you very much.